Good evening, everybody. So my name is Rose. I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis, and we are very pleased to be partnering with the St. Louis Zoo to bring you tonight's science seminar, Bumblebees, Birds, and Genius Flies, How Animals Learn to Make Choices. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Academy, I'm going to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about who we are. We're an independent science organization supported entirely through community contributions, and at venues throughout the region, we connect science and the community through free and our very low-cost public talks, science seminars, workshops, and trips and tours that feature scientists and engineering professionals, both of national and international renown. And in addition to advancing the public understanding of science, it's our mission to inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. So we also offer a number of free and low-cost opportunities expressly for teens, such as our Teen Science Cafes, Teen Cafes Youth Leadership Council, and Junior Academy of Science. You can find more information on the Academy and all of our community-wide events by visiting our website at academyofsciencestl.org. You may also visit us on Facebook or Twitter, or before you leave this evening, pick up some of the literature that is on the table just outside the auditorium. Um, I do want to mention a couple upcoming Academy events that you might have an interest in attending. On Tuesday, December 2, Missouri Botanical Garden Research Specialist Ashley Glenn talks about the history and use of native Missouri wildflowers in backyard folklore. That's from 10 a.m. till noon at the center of Clayton. There's a modest $10 fee to attend this event, and you do need to register, and you can do so on the Academy website at academyofsciencestl.org or by calling 314-533-8586. On Wednesday evening, December 3, again at the St. Louis Zoo in the Living World Auditorium at 7.30 p.m., and also as part of our science seminar series, Washington University engineering professor Li Hong Wong talks about reversing time and other engineering breakthroughs in reversing time, photoacoustics, and other optics breakthroughs in biomedical imaging. Again, you can find more information on our science opportunities, talks, trips, and tours on the Academy website or listed on the event flyers and Academy literature that's available for you to take with you before you leave tonight. If you'd like to receive e-notification of upcoming Academy public lectures and events, there will be some e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience. If you're a student and you need to verify your attendance, we'll have some cards that you can pick up from the Academy at the table outside the auditorium after tonight's Q&A. Uh, please turn off cell phones or any other electronic devices that might make noise during tonight's program. And with all that said, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Amy Dunlop. Amy Dunlop received her undergraduate degrees in biology, history, and English from the University of Memphis, her MS in biological sciences from Northern Arizona University, and her PhD in ecology, evolution, and behavior from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. She is currently an assistant professor of biology in the Department of Biology at the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Prior to coming here in 2012, she was a postdoctoral research associate with the Center for Insect Sciences and the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Arizona, where her primary research focus was and continues to be investigating the role of environmental variability in the evolution and ecological function of cognition or learning, memory, and decision-making. How do animals track changes in their environments? When is learning and tracking a good strategy? How should animals weight different sources of information? Amy's research also focuses on the interplay between evolution and cognitive mechanisms. She is the author of numerous published peer-reviewed papers on learning and memory in animals, and we are pleased to have her here with us tonight to talk about her work and how animals learn to make choices in bumblebees, birds, and genius flies. On behalf of the Academy of Science and the St. Louis Zoo, won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Dunlap. Thanks, Rose. So winter has struck rather suddenly for us here. Um, when I was a young student in college, I moved from the warm location of Memphis to Finland. So this is a picture from Finland in winter. And it made me wonder, how do animals make a living? How do they make a living when the world becomes a really tough place to make a living in? This is also a question that a lot of uh, biologists that have focused on how important decision making in, is in animals have kind of focused on this idea of winter. There's this uh, um, thought experiment of what is life for a small bird in winter? It's cold, 
You have to get enough food to thermoregulate, not starve to death, not freeze. Every decision that you make can have crucial impacts on your survival. Okay, so when I'm thinking about you know, decisions, uh, I kind of think about this crucial case where, where it's make it or break it. And so what I think about particularly are when and how to track changes in the environment. Where are you gonna find food? It's not always found in the same location. Um, when should you learn? Sometimes learning is not the best strategy. Uh, what information should you be learning about in a whole world full of stimuli? Um, how do you know what's more important? What should you attend to? And then how long should learning last? We know that we shouldn't remember everything forever. That causes a lot of trouble. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is tell you uh, some pieces of, uh, some of my favorite pieces of research on these three topics. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about birds and how long learning should last about memory. Um, what information should learning be about, some studies with bumblebees, and then when to learn, some studies with fruit flies. Okay, so how do some animals make a living in the winter? Well, a really common strategy is to hide a bunch of food. So we can look in our backyards and we can see squirrels. Um, there's a wood mouse that's uh, in Europe, lots of mice hide food. If they ever get in your house, you find this out, they break into your dog food and hide food everywhere. And a superstar of hiding food is this Clark's Nutcracker. So Clark's Nutcrackers live at high elevations in the West, and they are superstars of hiding food. They'll hide caches of 60,000 in a year, and they're super, super accurate at, at um, finding them again. This is, this is fantastic. It keeps them going, living in a harsh environment where a lot of other animals can't make a living. So when we think about memory, we can see, well, Clark's Nutcrackers, they remember things really well. It must have evolved this awesome memory to deal with their environment. But before we can really say that, we want to think of a few things first. Okay, so let's think about how natural selection might work on Clark's Nutcracker memory. Um, the first is that there should be, now this is straight out of uh, Chuck Darwin right here. This is, this is what's necessary for natural selection. There has to be variation, okay? Some birds are, are better at finding their seeds than others. There's some variation. Um, some of that variation is heritable. So uh, smart parents have smart kids that are also good at spatial memory. There also needs to be competition for survival and reproduction. Okay? It's a tough world out there. You're hiding a lot of seeds. There's a lot of squirrels finding your seeds and taking them, so you have to be, you have to be pretty good. Um, because of this competition and this variation, there's differential survival and reproduction, right? If you don't hide enough seeds, you know, you, you either uh, will, will starve to death in the winter or you won't be in really good shape and have lots and lots of kids. And then we assume that evolutionary change happens as the environment changes, and with it, the variants that do best. So let's imagine a situation of uh, when my grandfather was alive, he had very well awesome stocked bird feeders. If you're a Clark's Nutcracker in that neighborhood, it doesn't matter what the environment's doing. It doesn't really matter how good your memory is. You're going to do pretty well. Okay, but when winters are very, very harsh, that's going to favor the nutcrackers that can remember things better. Okay, this makes sense. Okay. When it comes to testing this, one good way to test this, and this is a, an approach in behavioral ecology, is a comparative approach, okay? So you take a really good look at natural history, uh, you generate comparative hypotheses about cognitive capacity. And a really classic uh, example of this is including Clark's nutcracker. So, so we're looking at these corvids that live in the West, this Clark's nutcracker, pinion jays, western scrub jays, and Mexican jays. And they live at differing elevations and depend differently on cached seeds. So nutcrackers and pinion jays live in these high elevations, uh, harsher environments. We predict that they'll have a greater reliance on cached foods and that they'll have these cognitive capacities to be able to find these cached foods really well. And uh, alternatively, pinion jays and Mexican jays live in these social groups and nutcrackers and scrub jays don't, so we can compare, say, social cognition among those. Okay. This is just one graph from very great many papers from the research program of Russ Balda and Al Camel, uh, where they did a whole suite of tests looking at memory across different time spans and comparing uh, Clark's nutcrackers and pinion jays with these uh, Mexican jays and scrub jays. Okay. So 
here we have this errors per cluster, so a higher score is uh, not doing as well with memory and a lower score is really great. And so here, as with a lot of studies, the nutcrackers and the pinion jays are clustering together and the Mexican jays and the scrub jays aren't. So that's really cool. This has been shown, this comparative approach for cognition across lots and lots of animals. All right, so, you know, if memory is an adaptive trait, it should vary in response to differing ecological demands. We can look at that. And we can make comparisons across species, but we can also make comparisons within species. And a really cool research program right now is one in Reno, Vladimir Pravosudov. He's looking at chickadees across elevational and latitudinal gradients. And he's shown that chickadees that are in harsher environments have a different structure in their hippocampus, which is involved in spatial memory, and they remember things better. That's really cool. I think it's very cool. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you about my favorite bird in the whole world. And lots of people who study birds think their bird is the best. It's not true, it's pinion jays. Okay, pinion jays live in the pinion juniper woodland in the west. They're super social, you know, permanent flocks of 300 individuals. Um, they do everything together, roosting, caching. And it's just really cool to be hiking in the west and you see a flock of pinion jays go over and they're all calling, crack, 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 crack. 300 birds at once, it's very, very impressive. Pinion jays are named for this pinion pine. They have a very uh, special relationship with pinion pines. And so the, the, um, where pinion jays live overlaps with pinion pines. And what they're able to do is get pine seeds out uh, from cones when they're still very green and hard to get into and other animals can't get them. So they have a, a suite of uh, morphological adaptations to be able to get these, these pine cones. They have an esophagus that's expandable. They can cram a huge number of pinion pine seeds in that esophagus, okay. Oh, thank you. Um, they have very strong, uh, you know, nice wingspan and, and strong wing muscles. They can fly pretty strong distances. And they have this very strong bill that's able to crack these things open. So just a little bit about pinion jay biology. They're specialists on pine seeds. They can cache up to 25,000 seeds per bird per fall in different locations. The pine seeds make up 70 to 90% of the winter diet. And many aspects of breeding depend on cache seeds. They start breeding in February in the mountains. They're feeding, the seed they're feeding seeds to all of their young. And they have highly accurate spatial memory abilities. They're also cool because they have this complex social environment, but we're not gonna really talk about that right now. Okay. They have division of labor during breeding. Females are the sole incubators of the eggs. They're breeding in February in the mountains. Males can't incubate. So birds have these brood patches. It's this kind of highly vascularized skin and it keeps all of the eggs warm. Male pinion jays don't have them. Okay, so the female pinion jays have to sit on that nest the whole time. They really can't leave for anything or the eggs are gonna freeze. So the females are relying on their male partners for all of their food and the males are providing previously cached seeds to the females. So they're having to feed themselves and their wives. Okay, so Russ and Al had these predictions that pinion jay females should forget spatial information more rapidly than males. And that males should show superior observational spatial memory for their mates' caches. So males should be able to remember things for longer and they'll be able to remember perhaps where their wives are caching also. Okay. okay, so it's time to test this. You go out, you catch some pinion jays, then you take them into a building with no windows so that you can test them. Okay, put them in little flocks in an aviary and let them pair up. Okay. And then we're gonna record their cache, cache recovery. And these are the basic, basic methods for this. Give an animal food and places to hide it in. Okay, then you wait a while and then you let them go back and see how accurate they are. This is pretty simple methods. Okay. The way we did this is we have a subfloor with holes drilled in it. You can put little Dixie cups of sand and lots of, and lots of landmarks, so lots of places for birds to hide food in. Okay. And so the first two experiments I'm gonna talk about were part of a master's thesis of a woman named Bonnie Chen, and then the next one is an experiment that Tom Green and I did, and then the last one was an experiment that I did, and we put all of this together on one paper. And the first question was for short-term spatial memory, are mated males and females gonna differ, okay? And then are pinion jays gonna be able to remember where their husband or wife cached? Okay, so you put them in a big room with lots of places to cache. And they can cache by themselves or with their mate or with a non-mate of the opposite sex. 
and we let them recover after five to seven days. And the way that we do this is we look at this errors per cluster. So we can have all of those holes open, they can cache seeds, and then we can see how accurate they are, or we can make it a little bit tougher, which let's imagine a bird cached here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna give it a multiple choice test. So we're gonna close all of the holes, but we're gonna give it an option. Was your seed here, 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 or here? That way we can come up with a very easy measure of what's chance. Chance is one in four. So what we found is that for errors per cluster, males and females don't differ after five to seven days in finding their own caches. But finding their mates' caches, males do very well and females don't do well at all. Okay. And then there's no difference between uh, you know, seeds of a non-mate. Okay. So males are paying attention to where their wives are caching, but the wives aren't paying attention to where the males are caching, and there's no big difference after seven to nine days. Well, let's look at long-term spatial memory. You know, over the, over the time course where they're having to breed. Okay, so we do the same type of thing in this room, and what we're doing is we're gonna have them uh, cache with their mate and recover a third of the caches over, over three time periods. Okay, now let's see what happens. This is how well they recover their own cache sites, and so at lower is a better score. So if we look at males, they're doing pretty well all the way up to 120 days, where the females are forgetting. Uh, if we look at how well they're remembering their mates' caches, it's just an extension of what we saw with five to seven days. The males are remembering where their wives are cached pretty well, um, you know, not as well as their own towards the end, and the females aren't remembering anything at all. This is pretty cool, but also kind of sad if you're a girl. <laughs> why, why are they so much better? For me, I find it sad. Okay, so males were more accurate than females at the long times, and... Um, Males find their mates' caches with a high accuracy, females don't. So is this sex difference just inherent in males and females? Were males selected with stronger spatial memory over time than females did, or, or is it not? So the first thing we did is we looked at working memory over the course of minutes. And we do this in this radial maze framework, which is what has been used to test lots and lots of animals, but we do this in a bird in this kind of open, open, open maze. So each of these little black dots here are places where food could be. And what we do is we let them go into this little room. And let's see where, this, uh, where the blue holes are. Everything's capped except for the blue ones. So four randomly chosen holes with a food reward. So we let the bird go in and, uh, and find where the food is. Okay? Then we let the bird leave the room. And then we open up four more holes. And the rule that they have to learn here is remember where you found food and don't go there again. Okay, so they have to win and shift. Some animals can't learn wind shift. Pinion jays can learn wind shift. So we give them this task and we give it over them, you know, where they have to wait over five minutes or they have to wait two hours and we're testing this working memory that they're able to do. So we looked at five minutes, 15 minutes, 45 minutes, 180 minutes and 360 minutes with unmated males and females. And we found no difference. So in working memory with unmated males and females, there's no difference between them at all. Okay, that's kind of interesting, but uh, maybe not surprising because we didn't find a difference with five to seven days in mated individuals. So how are unmated individuals gonna be able to do at longer periods of time? Females aren't always pair bonded. They take a good two years to find a mate. And sometimes a mate dies. What, are they gonna starve that winter? What's gonna happen? Okay, so we don't find any differences. Okay, so are unmated males and females gonna show the same pattern as, as the mated ones do? And the other question I was interested in, are females more susceptible to forgetting when rehearsal isn't possible? This is this idea of use it or lose it with memory. So we know that scrub jays move caches all over the place. Are they sitting up in a tree, and I'm anthropomorphizing here, but are they thinking, yes, I have a seed there, and a seed there, and a seed there? If they're exposed to this room, are they gonna do better later on? So we either let them rehearse by recovering in these times or they just have to wait for three months. And we find that rehearsal doesn't make a statistically significant difference in accuracy for males or females. They're a little bit accurate. Maybe it's biologically significant, but it's not statistically significant. It's not a very big deal. So the big question here is, is there gonna be a difference in males and females when they're not mated? And there's not. 
Okay, so when females are, are not mated, they're not showing this forgetting of their, of their spatial memory under long terms. So this is probably mediated through some kind of a pair bonding hormone. Um, these are females who had been previously mated. Um, we divorced them all before this study. Okay. Okay, so there's no sex differences in long-term spatial memory in non-pair bonded Js, and there's not support for a rehearsal effect. So this is kind of cool because it's a context-specific uh, type of cognition. The females are only forgetting uh, when they're pair bonded over these time scales, when presumably maybe holding on to those memories is too costly and they need to put every bit of energy that they have into taking care of their young. Okay, so males have to provide food for a group and they need good spatial memory. And uh, mated females have high energetic needs for breeding and maybe maintaining memories is costly. Okay. Um, because they weren't nesting, they weren't using space differently. It's something physiological that's happening. Um, one neat thing about pinion jays is that we guessed from this, and it still hasn't been tested, is that it's really important that you find a mate with excellent spatial memory. Okay? And we think that this might be why it takes two years for females to choose a mate and why there's so much courtship feeding. So are they using this winter to assess potential mates? It's even more important because a lot of birds will divorce if they have failed clutches or issues. There's no divorce in the pinion jay world. There's also no extra pair copulations. So finding a mate is super important in this case. Okay, so back to our small bird and winter idea. Um, we talked about a little bit about how la long learning should last, but what about how to track changes and what information should be about? Let's change to summer for a second. Um, this is summer in, um, well, spring in the Sonoran Desert near Tucson. Spring doesn't last a very long time. If you're a pollinator, this is a fantastic time to find food because there's lots of flowers out all over the place. Um, this is the time to find things because once summer hits, it's about as bad as winter is in the other case. Um, there's not a lot that might be flowering or it might be hard to find or it might be something that, that you just don't go to. So when and how are you going to track changes in the environment? Different flowers are flowering. Uh, they might be rewarding in different amounts. There might be different amounts of competition. So if we think about bees who are foraging on this ephemeral food resource, there's a lot of environmental change that they might need to track if they're going to make you know, the best decisions that they can make. And so this question is why I started working on bumblebees. The kind of questions we ask about bees are, when should you track change? Okay. When should you learn, use learning to sample changes and track them? Uh, maybe instead of learning, you should just rely on an inherited preference. Saves time. Just choose C. Just choose option C. Um, should you choose with constancy or randomly? Maybe you're not doing anything. You just come to the next flower. What's the best situation? What's the best decision type of rule to use in which each of these situations. The second question is which information should you learn? There's a lot of aspects of flowers out there. Of all the available stimuli, what should you attend to? And what should you ignore? If we think about, uh, flowers are pretty complex. Petals have certain textures, bees can learn about those. They have odors, bees can learn about those. Petals have certain shapes, bees can learn about those. How to enter a flower. Um, a study came out uh, about a year and a half ago that showed that bees can even learn about electrostatic charges on the petals. So if they can sense it and you put it in a study where that's what you have to learn about, they can learn about it. But maybe all of this information isn't agreeing with each other. What are you gonna, what are you gonna choose? And the next kind of type of questions that we look at are how are you gonna weight different sources of information? So how are you gonna in integrate you know, inherited information with individually acquired information that I've learned through trial and error or with information from other individuals. Okay, so these are the kind of the range of questions that we're thinking about with bees. And what a lot of this uh, depends on theoretically is the rate of change in the environment and the relative costs and benefits of the available choices. And this is the type of thing that we manipulate in the lab. So since you might be unfamiliar with bumblebees, I thought I would give you a little primer on bumblebees. So bumblebees are not honeybees. <laughs> Um, during the winter when, uh, uh, you know, blue jays are, are starving and finding, having to find things to eat, queen bumblebees are under the ground. They're not, they're not even having to make a living at that point, okay? 
And the spring, this, the single mom emerges. She has to forage. She has to find a place to build a, net, a nest. She has to make wax. She has to provision the young until she has enough individuals that then her daughters are going out and foraging and she's just staying in the nest, okay? Uh, towards the end of the summer, they start producing males and also new queens who go out and they mate and then the males die and then the queens burrow underground and this cycle starts again. Okay. Um, you're probably used to looking at honeybee colonies and you know, honeybees look, it's, it's so nice, these little hexagonal cells and it looks very orderly. Um, if you look at a bumblebee nest, it, it just looks like a bunch of stuff got thrown in there. There doesn't seem to be any structure. So they've got honey pots where they're storing nectar. They don't make honey, but we call them honey pots. Um, they have, these are puparia where they're uh, metamorphosing from larvae into adults. Um, there's eggs and larvae that have to be fed. Um, these are, they're actually males in here. It, people always think I'm telling a joke when they ask, how can you tell what the males look like? Well, they have mustaches. They, they do, so here's a male. That's not a male, <laughs> okay. So bumblebees are kind of cool because, you know, these, these queens really, it's make it or break it. Uh, you're trying to get all the resources you can because your fitness as a worker uh, bumblebee is completely dependent upon uh, the brothers and sisters that you can produce at the end of the season. Okay. Okay, so let's imagine you are a bumblebee and you have to make a decision. You don't know anything about the world. What are you going to choose? Are you going to choose, I guess this doesn't work now. Work? Oh, yeah. Are you going to choose this yellow flower or are you going to choose this red flower? Mm -hmm. Let's say you choose the yellow flower. I'm going to put this in terms of dollars because we think dollars. We don't think molarity of sucrose. Okay. So let's say that you chose, uh, we, we chose this yellow flower and we get a dollar of reward. Okay. Let's keep this in mind. Okay. What are you going to choose this time? Dollar's pretty good. Maybe there's something better out there. Okay, maybe you try something else. Let's try this. Okay, we can make $5 this time, $5 worth of sucrose. That's pretty awesome. Okay, now we've learned two things about the world. Let's make another choice. What are you going to choose this time? Red? Everybody going to choose red? Okay, $5. There we go. Okay. So the question is, you know, is yellow always bad or is yellow sometimes good? Is $5 good enough? You can just stick with this and not worry about anything else in the world? This is the question we're asking. When should you try things out? And when should you just stick with one thing? Let's imagine that the world's changed and now these yellow flowers are really awesome and they're $10. Well, you went with the red flower, you've just lost $5. Okay, these are the type of choices that we're thinking about. So how is experience affecting your choice? In the first case, we picked the yellow flower, we got a dollar. In the second case, we picked the red flower, we got $5. In the third case, we picked the yellow flower, we got $10. We, don't, we can't try both at the same time. You can't be in two places at once. You have to make these choices. Okay, so how is experience going to affect your choice? Let's imagine that the world changes like this. Those first two choices, I'll just give you the answers because we didn't try both flowers. We'll just say what it is. It was $1 and $5, $1 and $5, then it changed. Okay, now it's $10, $10. $10, now it's changed back to $1, okay? So what are you gonna do? You're not psychic, okay? But you wanna be on the $10 flower when it turns $10, but you don't wanna be on it when it's not $10. Okay, so how frequently, when one thing in the world is known, red is always $5, how frequently should you try the yellow? Okay, this is the crux of this idea, of when should you sample information? Okay, so there's costs to sampling too much, you know? You're hitting it at the $1, you're losing $4. What if the world doesn't change? What do you choose? That's easy, there's no real need to sample anything, right? You just pick the awesome thing and stay on it. What if we change these possible values? What if instead of $10, the good thing is $30? What are you gonna do now? If it were me, I would just sit on the yellow every single time and not worry about the times that I'm losing a little bit because I'm gaining more in the long term. Okay. We can put math to this, and what we can do is optimize. Uh, what we want to do is minimize these errors that we're making and say something about how does the costs and benefits in the world interact with how quickly the world changes.
And so when should we sample and when should we not sample? Okay. Uh, this is just how much you ought to sample. And this is when something in the world is really, really awesome. This is the $30 case. This is where they're identical. And this is this kind of, say, a pitiful case of like not very much more. Okay. And what this type of theory tells us is that when the world is completely fixed, you shouldn't sample. You should just pick something and stay on it. When the world changes a whole lot, you should pick something and stay on it or just choose randomly. And that sampling, gaining information, is really only good in middle rates of change. So a number of birds uh, have been studied in this. Uh, some mammals have been studied in this, and they did really well. But the question is, are insects savvy enough to sample and be, and be uh, flexible like this? Okay. So I wanted to find out. So what I did is I took uh, many colonies of bumblebees, and we know who they are because we super glue little tags to them. My mother calls them football jerseys. <laughs> um, the students are, call it turning bees really angry. They really don't like it when you squeeze them in a tube and glue something to them, but it's for science. Okay. Um, and then we want to give a situation where they're having two choices, where we can control those choices. We can control how much food is on each of those control choices, and we can control where they can only see one thing at a time. So I built this huge compound Y maze. Okay, so they can choose between yellow or blue, and one thing is fluctuating and one thing's staying the same, and we can change how frequently things change. Uh, we can change the costs and benefits of what they're doing. So are bees gonna do as well as vertebrates do in this situation, which it admittedly is very abstract uh, compared to flying around on flowers, but sometimes you, when you wanna control everything, you have to go to uh, something like this. So we give each bee 80 choices. The bee doesn't know that yellow is the same every time. She has to learn that through experience. Okay. All right. So remember from that theory graph, we had like no sampling, you know, where there's not a lot of change. So here, the environment is 99% persistent. That's not a lot of change. On this other side of the graph, there's a lot of change. And then in the middle is where we were predicting that there should be more sampling. And this blue is where the good thing is super good. And this green is where the good thing's not very good. And the red is where the mean is the same every time. So, you know, qualitatively, we see this curve, like we ought to see. But where things are very different is when the world changes an awful lot. We don't see bees parking themselves on one type of a resource or another. They're changing what they're doing. And that was surprising. So this is what we predicted they ought to do. Uh, bees respond to lots of changes, you know, with very changeable behavior. Um, one kind of cool thing that we found, and I'm not going to go through this whole graph, but this is, uh, you know, these types of errors that they, that they make. If they did really well on yellow, did they choose yellow again? If they didn't, we call that an, we call that an error. Um, if they go to yellow and it really sucks, you know, they should leave, right? You know, if they're making these perfect choices, if you win, you should stay, you, sh you should leave if you lose. And what we find is that when the world's super awesome, um, they won't leave after one bad choice. You shouldn't, right? You know, we kind of decided that if it's a $30 yellow flower, you should park yourself there. They are doing that in some, in some senses, but, but only for a certain number of choices. So that's, that's kind of cool. Okay. So let's say you're making this decision. Uh, you don't know anything about the world, but you're born with a, a preference. You're born with a bias, you know. That yellow looks really, really awesome. How is that going to affect your sampling? And what we find is that it does affect sampling decisions. I'm not going to show you the graphs for this. But if you really like something, you tend to stick to it. Okay? And it takes an awful lot of experience to erase that. Another question that we're looking at is uh, how is this, this uh, inherited preference going to affect your learning and your memory? Okay, so is it going to affect how quickly you learn something? And when you wake up the next morning, what are you choosing? The thing that was most rewarding when you went to sleep, or are you choosing this inherited preference? And a study I did with blue jays, we found out these overnight effects interact an awful lot with the rate of change and what they tend to choose. So what's going to happen with the bees? So we'll see. Stay tuned. Okay. Okay. Another thing that you can do is, you know, let's imagine our naive bee is deciding what to do. What happens if she looks out on a field of flowers and the other bees are all on the red flowers? What should she choose in this case? Red might be a good, a good option. Okay. 
so that's this, this idea that you can have information you're born with, you can have information that you've gathered through experience, and then you can just follow where everybody else goes. And this question of whether you should use your own information or whether you should use social information is something which an awful lot of people are interested in um, because there's costs and benefits to both. So for individual learning, we're thinking about trial and error learning. You have to try lots of things. It can take a lot of experience. It's pretty accurate, okay? But this delay from being naive to competent can take a long time. Maybe you starve by then, maybe you get eaten by something by then. And this response to change could be slow because you're having to do trial and error to track all of that. Or you could shortcut this by learning from others. Um, it shortcuts this expensive trial and error process. You're naive an awful lot less time. Um, theoretically, groups can track changes better than individuals, but maybe it's not as accurate. Maybe you're following bees that don't know what they're doing. Okay. So this is a cost of following others' information. Um, so these aren't bumblebees, these are actually carpenter bees, which are also pretty awesome. But social information in general is predicted to reduce sampling rates, allow better tracking of change. And it's predicted to be used when you're naive or when you're uncertain about the world. Okay, so let's think about whether bees are going to do this. Um, first of all, people that study uh, social insects, honeybees, tend to think of bumblebees as sort of the, you know, the dumb cousin. Um, they're not nearly as awesome as... Uh, it's honeybees because honeybees have this waggle dance, it's really cool, it tells all the other bees where to go. Um, bumblebees do not have a waggle dance. So it was thought that they didn't really use social information, but it's become very clear that they use a lot of social information. So um, where other bees are foraging influences their choice of flower type, how quickly they adopt a novel resource, how quickly learning occurs. Um, scent marks left by other bees on flowers can influence learning. It could be positive or negative depending on the, how the reward goes. Uh, bumblebees can use social cues to learn complex handling skills like nectar robbing. The plant people call it nectar robbing because they're going in underneath the flower and circumventing the pollen and just taking the reward. As a bee person, I call this pretty sensible foraging. Okay. Bumblebees can also use indirect social information about predation risk. You might think of bumblebees flying around in this beautiful world of flowers, but there are crab spiders and they can eat you. So uh, they have predation just like we think about with, you know, uh, zebras on the Serengeti, it's, it's just as tough for, for bees. Uh, there's also signals in the nest, so returning foragers can give food alerting signals. They have the pheromone from this turtle gland. If they have a really awesome food resource, they run into the colony and they run around, they run around, they run around, they bump into everybody, and then all of a sudden more bees go out to forage. Okay? The bees can use floral odors brought in, you know, on the fur of other bees, that's pretty cool. Um, and then these honey pots serve as a information center. They're constantly monitored. Um, how much food is in there, if a really good food reward comes back and is in a honey pot, more bees will go out. Okay, so, so bumblebees use an awful lot of social information. So when should they use it? We have a prediction that social information should be more useful when you're naive. Okay, so I did a quick experiment where we gave bees the option to learn about, this is flowers in my world, they're very simple, so they could have this type of a flower, this type of a flower. Um, and no, a first grader didn't make these, a college student did. Um, but what we did is we give them social information. So we have a, a dried conspecific, which they treat like real ones. And I call them zombies because I think it's funny, but other people don't. Okay, so is this gonna give them a cue of what's going on? And we let them learn when they're naive and when they already know what's going on in the world, okay? And then we test them. If you already know what's going on in the world, does having another bee there saying the answer is C, does that make you more accurate? Okay, so we do this factorial experiment where they can have social information in different situations. And what we find is that when social information is there, they do better. They learn better. But having social information after you already know what's going on doesn't make you more accurate. So social information is better when you're naive. Okay. So let's look a little bit about reliability because, you know, flowers don't always have nectar. Maybe somebody else has stolen the nectar, okay? So the question here is that, you know, we know that reliability matters for all kinds of learning, okay? Um, it matters theoretically for social information. Um, when I did do this study, we found out that when we test bees, there's no sugar there. If there were conspecifics present, they ditched their first choice way faster than if conspecifics were not present. So in the absence of reward, they're switching pretty quickly. So I wanted to know if reliability interacts with the information source. So let's Put it up against each other. Let's look at how reliable, say, 
flower color is versus social information. So we have a situation where flowers could be reliable to a certain extent, or bees could be reliable to a certain extent. They could both be equally reliable. Flowers are more reliable than bees in certain situations. What are they going to follow more? OK, what's more important? This is what we think that they're going to follow. And where flowers and bees are equal, you know, theoretically, economically, they should, they should choose them both equally. OK, so let's see what happens. So this is the case where bees and flowers are equally reliable, 50%. They're both 83%, they're both 100% reliable. They follow bees more in a world that is completely reliable. Okay, so when nothing's changing, they're favoring social information. Well, if we make social cues unreliable, we get this kind of interesting effect. So this is the floral, so flowers are either 50% reliable, they're partially reliable, or they're totally reliable. And then this is where social cues are completely unreliable. And chance is 50%. We see this situation where they're not just ignoring social cues when they're unreliable, they're paying very much attention to them and then avoiding where other bees are. So this is a very plastic response to social information in this bee, um, which is much more than, than most people that study vertebrates would have ever thought that bees could have been capable of, but they're, they're quite smart. So reliability matters in which type of stimulus bees follow most closely, and the stimulus types interact. I didn't show you the interaction, but social cues are followed uh, more when they're reliable, but also when they're partially unreliable. Okay, so 80, 83% is pretty good. And under some situations, bees avoid locations containing conspecifics. This opens up a whole series of questions about how resource type, competition, how all of this affects choices. So we're finishing up a study right now looking at that. Okay. All right. So let's think back to whether you should just learn or not. So learning is fundamental. It's, it's, it underpins all of a good deal of plasticity of behavior in all animals. It's also ubiquitous. There's some form of learning in every animal. Okay. So we know that experience matters because the world's a variable place, and learning enables all of this change to be tracked. Um, but learning is maybe not always the best thing to do. Uh, learning and memory have costs. It's still up for debate how much these costs are. Sometimes an inherited or a fixed behavior could be best, let's say, you know, in, in the case of our sampling bees. And sometimes experience can lead one astray. And my favorite example of this is um, how learning can be risky. We know that geese should be, you know, we've got this imprinting learning that happens in a certain sensitive period where the young imprint on their mother. And we know that this can go awry. So this is no Nobel laureate uh, Conrad Lorenz. He's very famous for having these water birds imprint on him. So here's a case where learning was maybe not a good choice. Okay. So let's think about when should learning evolve. And when should preference or a bias evolve instead of learning? Well, it depends on the change in the environment. We can think about this kind of intuitively. Um, a lot of people kind of break this down into in a completely fixed environment, you shouldn't learn. In a, an environment that changes, you should learn. Uh, but we can easily imagine that if the world changes too much, learning is not good all, you know, either. And in a fixed environment, learning still works. Okay. So there's this idea, kind of a Goldilocks principle, that too much change and too little change do not favor the evolution of learning. A lot of theory for a great many years, you know, trying to, trying to sort this out. But there's issues because, you know, uh, change is kind of difficult experimentally, and we're also talking about evolution, which happens over a long period of time. But let's think about breaking down change into two different components that are a little bit easier to understand. The first is this idea of certainty which is this overall probability that an event will occur or an action will be taken. Let's just say the proportion of flowers in that field that are really awesome. We can also think about reliability, which we're gonna define as the conditional probability that a given cue correctly predicts an event or outcome. So the reliability that a bee is there means there's gonna be a reward there. Or the reliability that a flower is orange, therefore there's gonna be a reward there. Um, if you put math to this, you will find that certainty and reliability interact to influence when learning should be favored. So in a world where experience is quite reliable, but the world is maybe not so certain, we should have learning. In the opposite case, where the world's quite certain, but experience is not reliable, you shouldn't learn. Okay. So this is pretty, pretty simple. It's, um, we call this, this a flag model. It's actually, uh, we did a, quite a few models. Dave, Dave Stevens and I did this. 
and everything always comes down to this, this basic inequality. Okay? If reliability is stronger than certainty, then you should have learning. Okay, this is great, but how do we test something like this? Uh, one issue with evolutionary studies is that we don't have a time machine. Okay, if we had a time machine, we could settle everything. We don't have to worry about comparative approaches. We don't have to worry about optimality models and how behavior matches that. Uh, but if we can experiment on evolution directly, uh, that will allow us to test these things. Um, so we could imagine setting up a world with high reliability and low certainty, or a world with low reliability or high certainty. We make all of these worlds. And since we don't have a time machine and we can't really experiment with you know, the, the path of evolution on Earth, we have to be a little bit creative. Um, let's maybe build some forests and put some pinion jays in. Uh, they take a really long time to breed, so that's maybe not a good idea. So if we're going to create worlds, we need an animal that A, doesn't live very long, and B, uh, we can create worlds for. And that's where the fruit fly comes in. Uh, fruit flies are awesome. Uh, they learn. They learn all kinds of complicated things. Um, they're a very good neurogenetic model for learning. They're also awesome because we know so many aspects of, of their... Uh, genes, plasticity, all of these things. And for fruit flies, we can create worlds by making little shoe boxes and putting different stimuli in them. Okay. So we're going to create worlds for fruit flies. We're going to have populations. We're going to put them in these worlds, and we're going to see what evolves. We're going to be able to directly test, uh, test theory by doing this. Okay. And the way that we're going to do this is we can't, you know, we have to choose something about the world. We're going to give them a choice of where to lay eggs. Okay, this is important because it's the most paternal, ma ma maternal care that these offspring are ever going to get. You're either put in a good spot or you're not. So this is very important. And the choice has fitness consequences. And that's because some of these eggs are going to be reared and some of them we're going to throw in the trash. Okay. Now we're going to put learning into the situation. We're going to have prior information that can inform that choice. So you're not just going blind, guessing, you know, should I go on orange or should I go on pineapple? We're going to give you some piece of information to guide that choice. And we do that by making... Uh, one of these tastes really yucky, so we put quinine with it, which tastes bitter. Okay, so let's pair quinine with orange, and they're going to learn that orange is yucky, and pineapple is really awesome. So we take these away, and then we give them uh, plates without quinine. If their behavior is being guided by this prior experience with the quinine pairing, they should be laying all their eggs on pineapple. Okay, that's this basic situation. Okay, we can manipulate certainty by manipulating fitness. So one of these choices is right and one of these choices is wrong. Okay. So we're either making uh, the next generation come off of pineapple or it's going to come off of orange. And the way we manipulate certainty is if in a completely certain world, the eggs always come off of orange. Always, 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 always. Every generation, orange is, is the best thing to do. In a more uncertain world, we're flipping a coin. The other thing that we're going to manipulate is the reliability of this learned information. This is pretty easy. The way that we do this is if this quinine experience is reliable, it's telling you to lay eggs on pineapple, we're going to rear eggs from pineapple. We can make quinine experience unreliable by rearing eggs off of what had been paired with quinine before. So what you learned was wrong. So, and over many, many generations, we can manipulate this. Quinine is reliable, it tells you what to do accurately, or it doesn't. And then we're manipulating the certainty at the same time. So you put populations of flies in the situation, you test them like this every generation, you do this for a really, really long time, like two years, and then at the end we're going to test all of this and see what happens. So the question is, in a completely reliable world that's uncertain, is learning going to evolve? And it shouldn't evolve here. Uh, so this is a score, this is a learning score, of, you know, we measured it as a phi square. This is a case where experience is reliable but the best action changes and we get better learning. We don't get better learning in the case of our control or quinine being unreliable or, or the best action fixed. This is really, really cool that we found this. Okay, what about non-learning? So we showed learning. We should see non-learning. We should see non-learning here, and we shouldn't see it here. And we're looking for preference is what we're looking for, an inherited preference. And one thing that we did at the beginning of the experiment is we assigned each line, each population, to either you know, in the first environment, orange is best or pineapple is best. And in an uncertain world, that would change. It's orange or pineapple, pineapple, orange. In a completely certain world, an orange best world is best all the time. It's always orange. So
So what we're assume, what we're predicting is that in a completely certain world that's, unpred that's unreliable, if you're an orange best line, you should evolve a preference for orange. If you're a pineapple best line, you should evolve a preference for pineapple. And that is what we find. So this is the proportion of eggs that they're laying on orange after, after 30 plus generations. And this is where quinine's reliable, but the best action changes. That's where we saw learning before. And this is the control. We don't see a difference. And then where quinine's reliable, but the best action's fixed. Uh, when orange was best, uh, we see an increased preference for orange. And when pineapple's best, we see an increased preference for pineapple. Okay, so over time, patterns of change are affecting what's evolving. You know, where learning is evolving and where preference is evolving. That left us with a lot of questions, though. Uh, what's happening on this line? What's happening in these other cases where, you know, s certainty is still better than reliability, but is preference going to be as strong here as it is here? So we did another experiment, which took forever, uh, where we tested a ridiculous number of lines, and um, this, this recently ended. And so I'm just going to show you two graphs, and the question is, what area of space here do we actually evolve preference, and what area of space here do we actually evolve learning? And this is sort of a heat map. We only have nine points here, but the basic idea is that where it's orange is where we evolved enhanced preference. So we're a pretty, pretty big swath of space where we, have, uh, where we have evolved preference. That's pretty cool. What was surprising is where we evolved learning. It was a lot harder to evolve learning. The world has to be super reliable for learning to evolve. So it doesn't evolve at 75% reliability. It, it might evolve somewhere in here, but we didn't test that. But it has to be super reliable. This was surprising to us. In follow-up studies, we actually uh, looked for trade-offs. You know, are, are flies that learn really, really well having as many kids? Yes. Are they living as long? Yes. Uh, the most surprising result we found was that flies that live in a completely evolved and a completely unpredictable world live longer. That's really interesting results. Okay. Um, the last thing I'm going to tell you about is this question about prepared learning. So across an awful lot of psychology, uh, and just intuitively, animals learn some things better than others. Uh, this big question started in the 60s with this Garcia effect with rats, where they showed that rats could learn to associate um, a taste of something with nausea, but they couldn't associate um, they couldn't associate a color of, you know, color of something with, with nausea. It had to be a taste. And if they shocked them, they wouldn't be able to associate a taste with shock, but they could associate, you know, flashy, flashy bright water. And then in uh, rhesus macaques, they've shown it's a really nice, nice set of work uh, where they learn phobias socially about, they can learn to be afraid about flowers, about snakes, but they don't learn to be afraid about flowers from other macaques. Why is this the case? Because if everything's equally sociable, we shouldn't have this. So there's a long literature about biological constraints on learning. And the big, uh, the big conclusion for all of us was, well, they must have evolved that way. Of course, you should be more fearful of snakes. You should learn that more quickly than flowers. You know? Of course, a taste of something should cause nausea. So we end up with a lot of this, uh, these sort of post hoc explanations about what's going on, but without this idea of how, how could it really evolve. And that's where experimental evolution is super awesome. You can take a situation like fruit flies and test, empirically test some of these ideas. And what we tested was this idea, like with, with we tested before, where you can gain experience about something and then perform an action later. Okay. But let's imagine you're some small mammal on the forest floor, you have a near-death experience. But before your near-death experience, you hear a rustling of leaves. You hear some bird going, ha, ha, You hear a squirrel chattering. Which of that should you connect uh, to avoiding being eaten in the future? So the idea is that there's lots of stimuli out there in the world that you could be gaining experience about. But if evolution is doing its job, perhaps you should be born more easily able to associate certain things than others. And what you should be more easily able to associate are what has been reliable across evolutionary time. So pairings that have been reliable across time, you should learn more quickly than others. And, uh, you know, a number of people have kind of uh, said this general idea over the years, but what we did is we put together a mathematical model to, to uh, quantify this, and then let's test this with flies. And the way we did this is we give them two things they can learn about in the world. They can learn about the color of something, or they can learn about the odor of something. Okay, so there's two things. 
and we put quinine with one of those. But what we can do is we can change the probability that color's reliable and the probability that odor's reliable. So in this case, you know, this green banana had quinine with it, you should avoid that. But what we can do is we can disassociate these. Okay, and by doing that, we can have treatments where color's reliable and odor's not reliable, or odor's reliable and color's not reliable. So are we gonna be able to evolve uh, are we gonna be able to evolve populations that learn about some things better than others based on this reliability? Um, so the model actually ended up looking just like the other one, which meant I modeled it three different ways, and it all comes down to this, so this is what it is. And we look at the situation where color's more reliable than odor, or odor's more reli reliable about color. Um, they're both equally reliable, so that's selectively neutral in our model, or they're equally unreliable, that's also selectively neutral in our model. So let's put populations of flies in each of these types of worlds and see what happens. And I'm just gonna show you one, one graph here, but this is the case where color's reliable and odor is, uh, where color's reliable and odor is unreliable. And this is how well they learn about color, and this is how well they learn about odor. So where color's reliable and odor's unreliable, they're learning about color better. And the case where color's unreliable but odor's reliable, they're learning about odor better than color. This was very, you know, I was very happy when this turned out because you never know what's gonna happen. Um, one really interesting result is when both things are reliable, what do you think that they do? You know, we would predict that they pay attention to both. They don't, they only pay attention to odor. So when two things in the world are reliable, um, they're not using one as a backup for the other. They're just evolving better learning about odor. So the reliabilities of these different Sensory modalities of stimuli, they influence how well flies learn, okay? And the patterns of reliability in the evolutionary history affect this evolution of prepared learning. And then in a multimodal world, these additional sensory, sensory modalities may not be necessary. So if two things are reliable, you don't really, you don't need both. Okay. So coming back to this idea of a blue jay in winter, I didn't really give you any blue jay data, although I did spend six years working with them. They're very, very cranky birds. You know, I hope that I've given you uh, some idea of uh, questions that you can ask and ways that you can ask them about how animals track changes in the environment. I hope that you realized even though, you know, there's just th three types of animals that I was talking about, these are broad questions about all animals, okay? We're using these as models to understand all animals. So when to learn, the world needs to be pretty reliable for learning to be of use, okay? Um, what information should learning be about? Well something that's reliable. If social information is more reliable, that's what you ought to pay attention to. If it's not, you should attend to something else. We expect animals to be flexible about what they use. And then how long should learning last? Well, in the case of pinion jays, we have this specific natural history situation. But we also expect animals to be able to, you know, certain information that's, they, sh they should be forgetting according to the expiration dates of different types of information, okay? And the reason why I expect this to happen is that A, maybe memory is costly, it seems to be. The other thing is that you have interference errors. The more memory that you have, it's, it's not remembering things that the problem, it's retrieving it. Okay, so this should be reducing, uh, reducing those types of errors. Okay, so um, collaborators on this with pinion jays, I worked with Rosbalda and um, with blue jays and some of the fruit fly stuff with Dave Stevens and then Anna Dornhaus and Dan Tappage, I worked with on bumblebees, some of the bumblebee stuff. And then it, it takes uh, an army to do this type of work. Uh, it's, it's a, especially fruit fly stuff, takes an awful lot of people. Um, and we have a lot of experiments running in the lab right now, and I'm hoping we can settle some of these things, but it'll definitely be a career looking at these questions. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yeah. They. Yeah. They have not. Um, they have looked at comparative work on hippocampus size. 
you know, with this idea that the birds with the stronger spatial memory should have a larger hippocampus, pinion jays fall off the line. They have a smaller than predicted hippocampus. So this is definitely an area, I think pinion jays are a bird that a lot of people ought to be looking at uh, because there's an awful lot there. But that would be one of the primary things to look at for sure. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, some of this is, it's not esoteric, but these questions of when you should learn things are very important, right? Um, if you imagine a world, so, I, you know, I sometimes try to imagine I have cousins that are autistic. And one idea behind that is maybe there's so many stimuli coming in, it's hard to sort out. I don't know if this is true or not. But we can imagine situations where um, I think it helps you understand maybe what some decrements might be and to give a little bit of an idea of, of what you really have to know in the world, right? So the theory that we look at is applicable to humans also, but it's really tough to study with humans. And humans evolved also. It wasn't like we got to a point in evolution and then it was like, boom, humans are so much different. They're a lot more, more similar than you would think in some of these choices, so, yeah. Yes? Yeah, that, I mean, that's definitely um, what could be going on. Now, the question is what came first, this decrement in female memory, where females are forgetting more, are males that are paying attention to the females. I mean, we would imagine that this should be co-evolving at the same time. So, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so for song learning, there's some birds that have to learn everything in this sensitive period. There's other birds that relearn it every year. Um, but we have a lot of theoretical predictions of what should happen with age and cognitive capacity. And I published a model uh, where we looked at how quickly should you forget stuff as you age. And we don't look at, you know, degradation of the brain. We don't look at anything you know, other than just lifespan. And what we find, what we found, which was kind of surprising, was that as you age, if you're in not awesome condition, you should have shorter memory length. And that is the best thing for you to do, is to not remember as well. That is optimal. Okay, so it's not that uh, having a shorter memory length is a bad thing. It's, it's just what works best at that stage of life. So there's an awful lot of uh, predictions about what should happen with age, and those are very fascinating. I think it would depend on the animal. Yeah. It's not really been tested. That would be my idea, right? So, uh, you know, we always have this idea that the neurons that you have are there forever, right? And then we find out with song learning that you have neurogenesis. And we found that in people, there are neurogenesis in some cases. You would totally expect that in that case. I don't know, I mean, it's not been published for that, that long. Russ used to make, uh, Russ Bald used to make bets with his grad students that if you remembered better than this bird, I would give you a case of beer. Um, and the birds always won. <laughs> so <laughs> they may have stretched it out that long, but that would be my expectation. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Um, I think they do about the same if we were to directly compare it. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be the case. Now, whether, you know, they're paying attention to what other birds are doing, you know, they're not paying attention to where their wife is, they're paying attention to everybody else's caches, we don't know about that. 
Yeah. Another student did a master's thesis where she was uh, paying attention to where the birds were looking, you know, and, and she did some of this stuff uh, with, with mates and non-mates. That was never published. Maybe it should be soon. <laughs> Um, they, they do have very high degrees of individual recognition. I don't know that sex differences have been looked at, but when you're talking about individuals that you're living with for 20 years, um, you might expect to, to see that. Uh, we do know that they also individually recognize the people that are taking care of them. They did a study looking at calls, um, and they do have different call types for the different people that are feeding them, which is kind of interesting. So they're very bright birds. You don't want to cross one of them, I found out in a study where uh, I took its caches away um, and I had to hire somebody to run that bird after that because whether I was behind a blind or not, um, she wasn't going to do anything. So <laughs> it can be very fun working, working with a bird like this. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I can tell you that, you know, birds uh, have a lot of predators. Um, when they looked at diets of occipiter hawks that kill other birds, they find zero pinion jays, zero. They find a ton of chickadees and scrub jays, they find zero pinion jays. Because pinion jays will not just alarm call, they will chase the predator off. So uh, we are trapping pinion jays one day and there's a there's a young hawk, and I'm like, oh, crap. You know, we're not going to get the birds because this hawk is here. No. No, the whole flock came in and chased it off. Um, there's reports of birds mobbing, uh, mobbing an owl and then stopping in a tree and taking a nap and then continuing to mob after that. So they're very, very fierce like that. Um, they roost in the same place. They, uh, they used to actually match the same locations in the trees. So you know Diana Gabaldon, who writes these uh, historical novels, there's making a TV show out of them. You may not know she has a PhD in biology. She did her dissertation on pinion jays. And she showed that they actually would match the same location in the same trees. They did this until ravens came in and, and Flagstaff. When ravens came in, now they have a search image for where all these tasty eggs are. And after that happened, the pinion jays had to change what they were doing. So they're really cool birds. <laughs> Yeah. So they don't have divorce, um, and they don't have extra pair copulations, which is crazy because lots of birds do. Um, they have what they call enforced, socially enforced monogamy. If a male starts hanging around a female that is not his mate, uh, the other females start chiding him, which is really fascinating. Um, so, you know, if, if there is a loss of a, of a pair on that pair bond, you know, the idea is they might, they might remarry, uh, but it's for life, definitely, in this bird. So, yes? S oh, the smartest pinion jays? They're probably the smartest animal I've studied. Uh, I mean, I've, you know, we have this idea of animals that are supposed to be smarter than others, and they tend to be social. They tend to live a long time. So here we're talking about a number of primates, we're talking about dolphins, we're talking about different cetaceans. Um, but pinion jays, as far as types of cognitive tests that people have done, um, they definitely match primates on these studies. Uh, so like this idea of transitive inference, that's like, if you know that A is better than B, and you know that B is better than C, and you know that C is better than D, can you infer relationships that you've never seen. And pinion jays do this. So they're, uh, they're definitely pretty smart. They're way smarter than blue jays. That was a little step down, I think. <laughs> as nice as they are, um, as nice as they are to work with, they're, they're definitely not as bright as pinion jays. You 
could see a theme where animals basically have to fly for me to work with them. <laughs> so, yes. That's definitely a strong possibility. You know, they're able to exploit a resource and because they have these strong bills, they can exploit that resource before any measly rodent can get into that, into that, into that cone. So, you know, there's this idea in ecology that you might have this spread out of, of animals uh, specializing in certain niches, and that's definitely a case. Yeah. I mean, the classic way people have done things like that is to like remove individuals from a population from a from an area and see if some other species or other individuals move in. Um, are, those are the type of classic tests. I think it would be kind of tough in an animal that flies really far and can be tough, you know, tough to tough to catch. But I'm sure some enterprising person could could look at that. They're definitely at higher elevations. Um, I mean, we're talking you know 9,000 feet or above. Yes. So there are definitely individual differences, you know. This is a hot topic right now, individual differences in cognition in the wild. Um, but there's a there's definitely a range so so I did a study where I took a lot of teenaged pinion jays into the lab and I gave them all kind of pinion jay IQ tests how well do they socially learn how well do they habituate to things and there's huge differences in individuals so whether that's inherited or developmental differences you know that's that's up for study but there's definitely differences and the blue jays we had some birds that were too smart for a lot of people to deal with if, if you were going to program a computer into a box, it would find your programming errors and exploit them to its own advantage. <laughs> you know, so there's definitely, there's definitely individual differences. We see them in flies also. So Isabel's studying individual flies right now, and she definitely has flies that are, even in our populations of smarter flies, there's still smarter flies within that population. So somebody has to be above average and somebody has to be below average. <laughs> so. Yes. So, you know, in the case of bees with more experience, they're able to get, you know, they make choices more quickly. You know, they have a greater foraging efficiency. You know, with the flies, we, we definitely evolved better learning. Which kind of begs the question of why aren't they super brilliant in nature, you know? Um, if learning is so awesome, why has my dog not landed on the moon? You know, so this brings to mind things like costs. You know, they're not super smart because they don't have to be that super smart in nature, but we can very easily evolve them in the lab to be smarter in these certain situations. A study we're doing right now is we're taking flies that evolved in these super reliable, uncertain worlds and we're putting them in a completely fixed environment. Is learning gonna be maintained in that environment where you could just have a preference? We're taking flies that evolved high preferences, you know, a high certainty environment, low reliability. We're also putting them in a fixed environment. And we're gonna see what happens in that case. We'll know that in June. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, there's a really clever study by Fred Mary and Tad Kowecki that looked at learning that would involve different types of memory in flies. They train flies under these two different circumstances and then they put them in the freezer. And the idea is the one that dies first is the situation that which cost more. And they found a very clear difference in that case. Um, so some of these things are kind of tough to measure, but uh, I'm hoping we can get at some of them. <laughs> yeah. I often think of the strongest costs as not being physiological, but these economic costs of making mistakes. Um, that's my 
gut feeling about what's going to be more important. Okay. Well, thank you.